<laughs> my dad married three times. <laughs> really? <laughs> Maybe it runs in the family. Oh, well. My girlfriend hopes not. <laughs> Fred Davis is on his seventh. Really? Oh. Yeah. Well, why marry them? That's one more than Henry VIII. Oh, yeah, only six, eh? Well, we have penicillin now, of course. <laughs> Maybe uh, Henry would have made it. How am I doing, Kate? That's great. All right. Yeah, how are you looking? Is Sean, uh, he's not shiny or anything? Yeah, it's good. Oh, it's very nice. Yeah, it looks great. Okay, good. And we were at... Yeah, we didn't talk much about Nathan. We should talk about Nathan a bit. Good, good. actually, I've got a whole little oh. section there. And, you know, I really will really have to start picking up speed. Yeah, the right. fighting words were the thing that brought me into touch with him. He was a very, very fine man, you know. Tell uh, me why, why was Nathan Cohen a fine man? Because he was, uh, he was one of the greatest reviewers in the world. In my humble opinion, if an actor may be permitted an opinion, uh, he, he would write columns about productions ranging from Stratford to whatever, to some... He went everywhere, to the local basement in under the ground theatre. He would be sitting there. He was a very large man. Fat, I guess we would say. So you had to take an, an arm off a chair, so he would have two to sit in. He carried a, a sword stick. And uh, he would tell you what the playwright had written, what he felt they had done with it, what the play was about, and why he liked it or didn't like it. So he would give you a total, so you, instead of, well, sometimes I read critics that I would call somewhat obscure, where I literally cannot tell what the damn play is about after, you know, what, what, what he saw, it's all so clouded. Now, I'm not saying a lot of critics do that, but some do. Cohen never did that. He was, he was in the tradition of George G. Nathan and Brooks Atkinson and uh, going back to Hazlitt. 200 years ago, Hazlitt described Iago in the play Othello as a man who killed men in the dark out of boredom. Perfect one-line description of that dark, bastard of the theater, Iago, that dark soul, killed men in the dark because he was bored. <laughs> is, that a way, is that a way to describe a character? Well, Cohen uh, came to see a play I directed at a synagogue in Toronto called The Wall, which is a book by John Hersey about the destruction of the Polish ghetto in Warsaw, the Jewish ghetto. Uh, and there were some people at that synagogue reluctant to stage it since they felt it was harrowing. I felt that it was a victory because when they revolted, when the Jews revolted, they held up two divisions of the German Wehrmacht who should have been on their way to Russia. That wasn't easy. So I, I saw it as a military victory. And the rabbi, fortunately, agreed. <laughs> so we did it. And it was a big production. I suppose I can tell you st tales out of school now. I went to an old friend of mine who was in the costume department at CBC because you had a lot of German officers in this, you know, Wehrmacht officers as well. The whole cast was Jewish. And uh, she said, uh, yes, I'll help you. And they got me these Nazi uniforms, perfect, as you would have on television. And she also came to the theater and dressed and looked after everybody every night. That's, you know, that's great to do that, for no money, and disciplined, you know. A little problem in the first couple of days of uh, costume, because when you put a Jewish actor into a, a German major's uniform, something happens psychologically to him, you know, the jackboots. Anyway, Cohen came to see it, and he thought it was, you know, a remarkable piece of work. He said, why do I have to go to a synagogue at Wilson, way up north in Toronto, to see a play, to see Hersey's The Wall? Then he came to see Red Roses for Me, which was an O'Casey play I did downtown at the York Community Theatre, which was a really good theatre in Toronto. And then he, I think he must have had a chat with Joe Schochter at the Citadel Theatre and said I was the boy to bring out to uh, head up the theatre. There's always been a joking debate about whether or not he wanted me to go to Edmonton or just get me out of Toronto. <laughs> We've always laughed at all. But he came out to see the shows, came to see Othello. In fact, one of the last plays he saw before his premature death was Othello at Edmonton. 
and uh, he was quite a marvelous man who who wasn't you know about 47 when he died he, he appeared to be much older and didn't discourage people thinking that he was 77 but he had a bad heart and finally he lost the curtain fell on him one might be forgiven for thinking he'd be dying to get you out of town because oh uh, i know that was a joke no I know, but, <laughs> but, but he was so other people might say he was just so savage with his, with his well, they did a program once, I think it was the fifth anniversary of his death, uh, on, on radio, uh, Zosky, Peter Zosky. And all I could think of, we were talking about Cohen, Robert Fulford was on it, and I was on some other people. All I could think of were the bad things. Finally, Zosky had to say, he, he was very fond of your work. And I said, oh yeah, well, what, what were the good things? I said, I can't remember them, I only remember the bad ones. <laughs> like... Um, in Twelve Angry Men. You know, I, can still, I can quote them to you without even looking at a newspaper. I, I play the Madison Avenue executive, which he said I played like a Bloomsbury poet. You know, that stung. And when he saw my Iago, which did hurt me, he said there was a little too much Sabatini. He's talking about Raphael Sabatini, who wrote Captain Blood. Too much Sabatini and not enough Shakespeare. Makes a very nice alliterative line, but it hurt me, I felt, because I wanted to please him. So he could be quite acid, but when he liked you, you knew it, and you know, and, and it was important because he was the, lead, I guess he and Herbie Whittaker were the leading uh, dr drama critics, you know, Whittaker of the Globe and uh, Cohen of the Star. He elevated the uh, the whole relationship between a drama reviewer and the publisher of a paper. I mean, if he wanted to go to Bulgaria and to see a season of plays, then he just the star sent him to Sofia, got him an airline ticket, and that was it. Not, not saying, may I, can I, you know? So you can imagine how he felt about, say, flying to Edmonton to see what was at the Citadel, or flying to, he came to see plays at uh, New Brunswick, when it was the Beaverbrook Theatre, before it became Theatre New Brunswick. And that's another story, when I went down there to uh, Fredericton, Lady Dunn, who was, I think, the widow of Beaverbrook, looked at the design of the Beaverbrook Playhouse on the main street and said, what's that? What's that? That's the fly gallery. You have to have it at the back so you can take the scenery up. It destroys the line of the street. Take it off. So there was no fly gallery in an 1,100-seat theatre. Now they've got one because they had to then go back and build it on. The gallery at the back over the stage is where you take the scenery. I mean, it may look ugly, when, you, when an architect draws it, but you have to have it. I know of no other way of doing it. It spoils the line of the street. Take it off. So off came the fly gallery. That would be like saying, the camera ruins the decor in the room, so we have no camera, we have no show. Yeah, and Mr. Swervik you worked with. Oh yes, he hired me. W what would that be, 1965, I guess, 65 and 66. Uh, he was the artistic director. Oh, dear old Brian, you're gone now. We did, one of the plays we did was The Knack. And one of the actors, uh, Brian's idea was to say, well, everybody's got their lines and we'll do two or three hours rehearsal and then we'll all go home. I mean, you can't do a play that way, you know. That's why you have eight hours a day rehearsal. So they got a, a bar of soap and took an imprint of the, of the key to the theater and had a key made and then gave it to me so I could go in and rehearse. <laughs> and Brian would come back and say, you guys are really getting very good. <laughs> Simplest way to deal with it. I don't think, I think Brian went to his grave without ever knowing that happened. Very good, we're very good friends, of course. And he was, but he, uh, directors, unless you really love your actors and love what they're doing because you're one of them, directors sometimes get bored and they sort of fall asleep, you know, mentally. And then they cut rehearsals short and so I don't like that. I mean, you have to practice, as people say, you have to rehearse. That means going over and over. The great pianist Arthur Rubinstein, one of the greatest pianists of all time, used to say, if he missed a day, nobody knew. If he missed two days, he knew, playing the piano. If he missed three days, the audience knew. And I believe that. Find a non-professional theater. The, uh, the the people who weren't being paid felt they could uh, come and go or not rehearse enough. Oddly enough, I haven't found that. Uh, that is the true. You're talking about the 
uh, the, the amateur, which is to play for love. Stanislavski, who is a man I admire very much, the great uh, Moscow arts teacher and director and actor, was an amateur. He was, it was a title that he carried to his grave proudly. He was a lover of the art, an amateur. Uh, and his productions are, of course, legends in, you know, of Chekhov and uh, Gorky. The true amateur, and I have done a lot of work, I mean, when I did The Wall, the cast was Jew, made of Jewish amateur actors. Uh, it was a wonderful experience because they would open their veins for you if they thought that you were going to make them look good. In other words, the work is going to be good. And, you know, after all, it uh, takes an, any kind of intelligence to realize that if you rehearse and go over and over the part and you have somebody guiding you and you pick things out of, that, of it that will be effective, you're going to, well, as they did on the wall, make a tremendous impression on people like Nathan Cohen, who counted, and people like Whitaker, and dear Rose MacDonald of the Telegram, which was a paper that died, was replaced by the Toronto Sun. There were three critics. She was a dear critic, Rose MacDonald, who used to call me that disturbing young Irishman. <laughs> Was the, uh, was the Beaver Book the only game in that whole province? Oh, it was an extra, that, well, uh, the, uh, the province didn't seem to mean much to me. New Brunswick, Fredericton was the capital, and they had an art gallery which was the fourth most prominent, because of course it was Beaverbrook City, and he was wealthy, you know? Uh, it's still a very prominent art gallery. It has a great collection of uh, Winston Churchill's paintings, for instance, who was a friend of Eva Brooks. It has a, an extraordinary dolly of Don John rising from the ocean, you know, a whole big, big painting. It has a very fine Krieghoff gallery, Cornelius Krieghoff, the great Canadian miniature painter. I used to spend a lot of time walking around it when I was at the theatre. And then it has this fantastic theatre. I mean, if you were to fill it, 1,100 seats, if you were to fill it every night, you wouldn't have anybody on the streets. <laughs> it, would be, it would be deserted. Uh, then I think they reduced the size of it, put the fly gallery back, or built it, and it became TNB, which is, of course, Theatre New Brunswick, to give it more of a, of a belonging to the province of New Brunswick. But in the beginning, it was the Beaverbrook Theatre. I can remember, uh, I was there in 19... 67 doing a play and why do I know that because it was the hundredth anniversary of confederation and I was directing a play called I know the the cradle will rock was the was the original title you you never it's never too late was the play and we all went after the performance across 1967 to the Beaverbrook Hotel and we went into the bar it was crowded all sorts of people from the theatre and everywhere else, and the cast. Warren Van Evera, the Lord have mercy on him, was having a beer, and as the clock moved up to midnight, it is now going to be July the 1st, it is the 100th anniversary of the country. So he stood up, the bars, everyone's talking, said, Happy birthday, Canada! And there was dead silence, and he looked around and said, Oh, sorry. <laughs> he sat down and drank. I mean, people were stunned. There was no cheering. You could not be cheering. Said, Sorry. <laughs> that was the hundredth birthday of the country. Quintessentially Canadian moments, though. Uh, could you tell me the Company of Ten and could you use the term the Company of Ten? I don't re remember that. This would be TNB, I guess. That must have come after my time. This would be, be after it was called the. the I guess there was a Company of Ten people, yeah. but I wasn't involved in that. Okay, we won't use that. Do you agree with the following statement? In the mid-60s, the Beaverbrook Playhouse functioned more as a rental hall for orchestras, ballet, and swimming. I would think that's probably true. I'm out of uh, touch with it, of course, because we, in the summertime we would go down and do the plays. And then what, the only person I met who came in in a, in a touring play was Pat Suzuki, the actress to do The Owl and the Pussycat. And I, I squired around and watched it because I was going into rehearsal for, I don't know, what the play would the knack or whatever the play would have been or you never can tell. No, not you never can tell, it's never too late. Was this uh, yes? Summer of 66, professional theatre got going there. Uh, yes. Yeah. So what, what, what was that? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not so sure what plays they did. 
uh, Swarbrick directed some of them. Michael Egan was the designer, I know that, because he achieved a great deal of distinction and still does, of course, later, and is a teacher of design. Uh, he worked with me at the Beaverbrook Playhouse. So Swarbrick's heart was in the right place. I wouldn't call him, as I recall, uh, one of, I don't know, without sounding awful, one of us in the sense of I wouldn't say that he was a real, I mean, like Leslie Yeo, for instance, who, who is a director, a man of the theatre. Brian was a journalist, in my opinion, and a very good one. Uh, he wrote documentaries for the CBC. He thought in terms of pictures and so on. But, uh, but to, to, to call him a theatre director in the same way would be like saying, well, I mean, that he also, it's like doing a little modelling on the side, like Judy Holliday used to sing with. No, I wouldn't include him in that. But he was, a, he was a good man. He was a good writer, which is something I respect very much. He wrote a play which was done at the Alex with John Vernon, The 48. And, I mean, I would regard him with great envy because I've always admired people who write because I can't really do it myself. See, everybody thinks, oh, I can do that. I can write a television play. I can try it. Try it if you, you know. Writing is a very special art. Did you work with any of the Canadians, the French Canadians in New Brunswick? Uh, was no, not really. I just knew them socially. Uh, and I wasn't as well up as uh, on the history of Acadia, as I should have been, I am now, of course, because I can go back and, you know, I mean, did a lot of plays about it and so on. Uh, I knew Louis Rub Robichaud, for instance, who was the premier of the province when I was there. He was Acadian. And I would go to parties. I didn't realize that there was a link between the Acadian people of New Brunswick and the Cajuns of Louisiana, for instance, which is, which is a corruption of the word and the food. And, I hate to sort of put labels on people, but I, I, I don't know what, I found them so hospitable when I went to their homes. It was mostly socially that I knew them, just as in fact the people who are French or of French descent in Montreal when I went to their homes. Extraordinary hospitality. And having been born in a country which is supposed to be hospitable, they gave rise to the phrase, come into the parlor. Um, I think I recognize that, you know. Hop over to the Shaw again, um, the old courthouse there. Oh, that was, uh, there was no John. <laughs> yes, it gradually impinged upon me that we were going to all have to make sure we went before we went backstage. <laughs> now, to be, uh, to be precise, the courthouse had a, had a John in the back of the auditorium, which meant, of course, that the audience was comfortable. There was no John at the other end, which is where the stage is. So we put in a Johnny on the spot in both dressing rooms, you know, those portable things that workers use, but nobody would use them because they made noise. It wasn't refined. Uh, the scenery was built outside at the back. We had a wonderful costume designer, of course, Martha Mann, who was uh, a gallant, I can't saying was again, I just saw it the other day, is a gallant lady who had a great love and understanding of actors she was a, ma a mistress of the soft answer that turneth away wrath. So that if anybody got into a tizzy, because some actors get quite fussy about their bodices and so on, uh, she could always calm and say, well, what, tell me what you want and we'll do it. You know? Some people get, I, I'm not one of those. I mean, you give me a costume if it fits. I usually like to wear my own clothes if possible because they do fit. Even if your cameraman doesn't think my sleeve fits quite right, they do fit. <laughs> and um, I, I, I don't really mind, I don't make a fuss, but oh, some people can be quite a problem with costumes, you know. And then the artistic director has to step in, or the director of the play. I usually settle it by taking the costume designer and the actor to, to coffee. I say, now I want you to discuss the problems that exist in your costume. And once we leave this table and have had our coffee, I don't want to hear one more word about it. And that works usually. So you have, you, in other words, get it settled. Instead of saying, pinching here, and this and this and so on. Obviously, it's usually women who have these problems, but uh, men too. And the directing there in that, in that theater, uh, there's some of the sight lines and... Yes, it was, uh, well, I had great help, of course, from the performers. You know, Jimmy Beggs was the, Hagen Beggs, as he's called now, was the lion in Andrew Kiss and the Lion. 
And I agree with what one critic in a newspaper said, that he was the best lion since Bert Lahr in The Wizard of Oz. I agree with that. He was absolutely marvelous. Um, Percy Rodriguez, who played Ferovius, of course, and who is a Montrealer and who is black. And that was the only time I had an altercation when they started to issue publicity about it being the first black actor to be in Androcles and the Lion. I thought, you know, why say it? Oh, I can remember stalking into the office in a rage, you know, because it looked as if I was saying it, which made me a kind of, I don't know, a do-gooder, you know. He's an actor. He's playing Ferovius. And he came on stage, and that's it, so he's black. So what? <laughs> and, uh, but they thought publicity, you know. I think that kind of publicity I can do without, frankly. I can get cranky thinking about it now, even. And he was such a... You wouldn't remember Rodriguez, of course. Montreal, oh, he's a wonderful actor. He, he was in The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, the uh, Hollywood... In fact, he went to Hollywood from the Shaw Festival to make that picture. And he was going to stay in a boarding house, don't forget, this is the first season in which all the actors were, which was run by an ex-Indian Army Sergeant Major, terribly British. And I've already been quite upset by the publicity about uh, the blackness of Rodriguez. And I'm going to pick him up at the airport in my car when this Sergeant Major from the top says to me, Hey, Sean, what time is your darky friend get here? <laughs> <laughs> I look up and say, Geez, don't call him that, don't say anything like that. Because Percy was a, oh, he's a wonderful actor, yeah, great actor, and a wonderful fellow. Tell me, I've got to see, <laughs> see that movie. Yeah. Oh, it's an old, it's a Carson McCullers story, The Heart is a Lonely Hunter, Alan Arkin and Percy Rodriguez. And he's done all sorts of, I mean, he's getting on now, you know, done all sorts of, uh, television things, Colombo and the various series, you know. Yeah. Was a Montrealer, and as I certainly remember, very black. <laughs> Maver, one word, Maver. Maver I knew as an actor, he was a brilliant one. I didn't know anything about him as far as the, uh, certainly the, he, he had some work to do at the show, I think, but he, I, I never, nothing that crossed my path there. But uh, the memories I have of him are as a splendid actor. I did television plays with him. I have some stills, in fact, working with him. I, I have a feeling that it's a pity that he didn't do more on stage. I saw him as King Lear, of course, at the Crest Theatre. Uh, I think the theatre lost something by him. Very good writer, like his books, like his plays. I was in his television play, The Man Who Caught Bullets which was an excellent play in which uh, Everett Sloan, the American actor, starred. It was about the last commanding officer in Korea with the Canadian Army who didn't tell the troops under his command to stop firing because the truce that was set for 11 o'clock or something. At 10 o'clock the war is still on. It shows you the insanity of the military mind. He was then sued by somebody who was killed at 10 to 11 or something by some mother for the death of her son since they had agreed already that the war was over. Interesting, isn't it? The man who caught bullets and, and this general and his attitude to it, you see. Because, I mean, it's like the old Colonel Blimp story, war begins at midnight. I mean, what are they talking about, these people? We're talking about people getting killed, lives being lost, you know? It's, you can tell I'm a pacifist is why I like Ocasey. But I mean, all these people who sit around these conference tables and say, well, we will have a truce that will begin at one minute past twelve. What happens at quarter to twelve? They're still firing at each other? You see what I mean? I mean, it becomes, you'd need a Bernard Shaw to deal with it, and he did, of course. Couldn't there have been an, equi couldn't there have been an equivalent for you? Say, a, a, say a, a show bombs and you got to do the last show. Oh. Isn't that a similar situation? Oh, I, 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 well, oh, if, if you've got a turkey on your hand, something that isn't successful, well, don't forget that you could be, uh, you could a show, well, uh, when I think of things like The Citadel, of course, you didn't have any of that because you, uh, your theatre was full all the time. But you did have something interesting that did happen because you, each subscriber bought the plays at the top, and there were seven. So you had their money, the cheque. 
which meant, of course, that you were very popular with the bank because you were putting large sums of money. And this is what theatres everywhere are now crying the blues about. They can't do that, you see, um, because the grants are being cut back. It may be a break for the customer, by the way, that, because in the end they may have to make sure that the shows are good always. Anyway, let's not get into that. But if Mrs. Murphy, to use an Irish name, says to me on the steps of the Citadel Theatre, I didn't think that uh, play that I saw last night was all that good, Mr. Mulcooky. Uh, I can't say to her, well, that's tough, because she could say to me, you didn't say tough when you asked me for my check for the seven plays. You didn't say that's too bad then. So really, once you do take the subscription check up front, you do have an obligation. Now, I'm not saying that everything has to suit the, uh, the audience perfectly. Uh, they, may, they may disagree, but they must never be able to say that you, it was not well mounted. And there's a difference, you see. You may do a play by Samuel Beckett, and they may say, I don't like the way he writes two people in dustbins and all this kind of thing, and the way they talk to each other, and where, what this, uh, waiting for Goddard with the chap walking around with a rope around his neck and a fat man hanging on to him, you know? And they call the guy with the rope around his neck lucky? What is all this? I said, well, that's Beckett. But did you not think the acting was very good? Oh, yeah, well, that's what I'm here for, is to see that you follow what is happening on the stage. Now, if you don't like Mr. Beckett, write him a letter. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay. We're going to get rather intensive on that. Let's sit it down in a moment. Okay. okay.